predictive inference, as well as interaction of the three parts. Dr. Ramdas' areas of applied interest include the neuroscience, genetics, and voting. He is one of the organizers of the amazing and diverse study ML, I think that's machine learning group at the uh, Kennedy Mellon University. The title of his talk is Online Multiple Hypothesis Testing. So before I, um, before I, um, so I want to, because this is a, is a, is a, is a virtual seminar, so we may experience technical issues during the seminar. So if this happens, please be patient while we fix such issues. And also feel free to ask questions during the seminar by raising your hands or using chat box. But the speaker may not respond to your questions uh, timely in the middle. If so, please be patient. And also there will be a pause for questions in the middle of the seminar when Dr. Ramdas finishes the first part of this his talk. And also there will be time for questions at the end of the talk. So now let's welcome our speaker, Dr. Ramdas. Thank you very much, Yanming, for the great talk. I'm uh, sorry for the great introduction. Uh, I'm just trying to set up my participants list so I can see the hand raises and the chat room and, and so on in such a way that I can also see my slides. So just give me one second. Hopefully that will work. All right, so that works. Okay, so thanks again, everyone, for, uh, for joining. I know this has been a, a tumultuous week for uh, UNC Chapel Hill. It's been in the news. I, um, I empathize very much. We're going to go online ourselves next week. Um, and so thanks in the middle of all that for, for making it to this uh, talk. Um, so as you can see, my title has changed slightly. The title now has another phrase in it, doubly sequential experimentation. Um, and uh, I'll explain to you what that is. It kind of is a high level setup for why I'm studying the online multiple testing problem in the first place. Um, and I'd like to acknowledge funding from the NSF Career Award. Okay, so um, as people come in, I thought, you know, most people probably don't know who I am or what I work on. So I thought I'd give you a, a very quick one minute intro to things outside of this talk in case, you know, you want to set up meetings with me tomorrow uh, to talk about other things as well. So I work on multiple hypothesis testing in uh, different kinds of structured problems. So uh, high dimensional variable selection, uh, connections to causal inference, so causal inference in intersection, multiple testing, um, and you know, should we model X or should we model Y given X? I'm much more on the, on the model X side. Um, and so, you know, uh, things of this nature is one of the uh, themes I've been working on for several years. Um, a kind of independent theme, whoops, that didn't. An independent theme is uh, distribution-free predictive inference for black box machine learning models. So uh, we all like to use our deep nets and random forests and uh, boosting algorithms these days. The question is, how do we give inferential guarantees without making distributional assumptions? And so if you've heard of it, there's this area called conformal prediction, uh, you know, ideas for how do, you, how do you do this with regression, uh, calibration methods for classification, and how do you use ensemble techniques as wrappers, uh, uh, around existing methods to provide inferential guarantees. So um, that's another area I'm very excited about, been working for a few years. Um, and uh, something that I call safe, anytime valid sequential inference. So here uh, we're trying to get, you know, tight confidence intervals for, you know, things that we're trying to estimate at arbitrary stopping times. Um, so we have been designing new super martingale based approaches to quantifying uncertainty and uh, how, how we view testing and estimation as basically betting against nature. So if you're you know, interested in any of these topics, I'd be happy to talk more about them uh, tomorrow you know, in one-on-one in -on -one, -on -one meetings. So I kind of publish half my work in stats journals and half in ML conferences. So some of these things you may not have come across depending on uh, you know, the literature that you read. So for today's talk, this is joint work with uh, several amazing collaborators. Uh, some of these are my PhD students, some are my postdocs, some were, you know, Martin Wainwright, Michael Jordan were my postdoc mentors. So this has been a work that has been going on across my, my postdoc and the start of my faculty career and, and so on. So I'd like to acknowledge all of these people, their work will, you know, be referenced at various times uh, during this talk. Um, so again, for just for this talk, it's going to cover a sequence of works uh, the earlier ones were more in the ML literature. Uh, the later ones are more in, you know, stats, 
stats journals, uh, as you can see at the bottom. Um, and yeah, so I'll, 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 I won't be able to obviously talk about most of these things, but I'll try to, you know, give you the, um, the ordinary least squares introduction, uh, essentially, you know, can't cover the Lasso today, but at least we can cover OLS. So, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll try and motivate why we're interested in this problem, what the, uh, what the basic algorithms are, and hopefully if you're interested, you can, you can catch up with the latest uh, work later on. Okay. So um, uh, I, like, I like the fact that uh, Anneli actually asked me to uh, give her some student questions, some questions for students to think about. And so that actually made me thinking about oh, what are the high level questions that actually drive my work? You know, we're often when we give talks, we go zoom, zoom straight in into the technical questions. So I thought I'd start off with some high level questions that I sent the students. So this is the, these are the four questions I, I asked the students. So here's the first one. In any scientific subfield, you know, this could be your favorite one that you work on, neuroscience, genetics, whatever it is, do the relevance and the importance of the claimed or published discoveries, uh, do the relevance and importance depend on the order in which hypotheses were tested by various scientists over time? Um, I think that they do. Um, and uh, a meta question is, should they depend on the order in which these hypotheses were tested over time? Um, that I don't know, and that's a little bit more of a philosophical question. So that's like the highest level question. Like in science, we test things over time, and somehow our discoveries depend on what was what was found before us, and how important our discoveries are depend on what was found before us. Um, okay. B. The second question I asked the students was for large. This is like zooming in more and more. For, for large publicly shared scientific data sets, so again, every, and every one of our favorite fields has their you know, big data sets that everyone likes to download and work on, is the statistical validity of the proclaimed discoveries, is it affected by how many other people have downloaded the data set and tested hypotheses on it? Okay, so like, can a data set get stale? What happens when some downloads lead nowhere and so nobody tells you that they downloaded it and nobody tells you what they tried and so on while other downloads of the data set lead to some interesting findings and are eventually published so um should we be worried about this or should we be like it's okay let everybody download this let everybody test the hypotheses and not tell us what they tested and we'll only publish you know what what ends up being interesting so i mean that's again just a question think about it it happens all the time but we don't question it much. So a third question is, we, we often correct for multiple testing. So again, getting more and more detailed, we often correct for multiple testing at a particular scale. And that scale often is within one paper. So within one simulation within a paper, or maybe just within one paper, that's where we usually correct for asking many questions. But, but should we care about other granularities? Like what about the lab level where you write many papers? What about the field level in which there are many labs and, you know, or the journal level, which might publish things from many fields. And if we should care about multiple testing at other granularities, then how should we do this? And if we shouldn't care and, you know, corrections should only be within a single paper, then why or why not? So just another thing to think about. I think, again, it happens all the time already. We just don't, you know, step back to question it. And the last question is obviously, it's a little bit me playing like devil's advocate. Um, suppose instead of testing 100 hypotheses today, and in which case you're forced to correct for multiple testing, what if we randomly order the hypotheses and we test one today and one tomorrow and one the day after and so on for 100 days? Since each day we only test one hypothesis, are we allowed to do so without any multiplicity correction? Because somehow when, uh, when, when we test 100 hypotheses in one go, we, we all know we should correct family-wise array, false discovery, something like that. But when we see these hypotheses one at a time, we think, ah, there's no need to correct. There's only one hypothesis. But um, I don't know. There's something unsettling about that. So these four questions are obviously related. And, uh, and, and I don't think I have the answers for all of them. But they're, I think, just kind of motivating questions for if your flight is taking off and you can't sit on your laptop, what do you think about, you know, that kind of thing. So uh, these are some questions for, for you as well. Okay. So now to get a little bit, you know, more technical, perhaps um, this uh, talk is going to be more about like what I call doubly sequential experimentation, which is a sequence of sequential experiments. Okay. And so 
I want to clarify, there'll be this word sequential that appears everywhere, but I'm not, or online, and I'm not going to talk about any temporal effects in the stock or longitudinal effects in the stock. Um, that, uh, you know, so if, 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 you, if you're used to thinking about time series or longitudinal data, that's not the aspect that I'm going to be talking about. So if for all practical, or, you know, for all purposes for my talk, all of the issues that I will raise arise in the IID setting itself or arise even with independent hypotheses and independent data, the issues already arise. Just like usual multiple testing, it's, uh, it's already a valid thing to think about even if things are independent. So that's the setting um, we're going to mostly talk about here. So this is a cartoon. So, you know, cartoon for, for science, if you want. And like all cartoons, we have to abstract things out a little bit. So this is my cartoon, uh, you know, abstraction. So on the y-axis, I have an experiment number. And so, you know, there's one, two, three, four. You can think of the experiments that way. On the x-axis, I have time, if you want, or the number of samples that you have collected so far. Okay, so, so this is how things proceed. Maybe this is within a lab or, you know, this might be within a, you know, some company in industries or a pharmaceutical company. Is that experiments start over time. They collect some certain number of samples and then they stop. And at any given point in time, there could be multiple different experiments running. So each horizontal bar over here is supposed to be, you know, like the first experiment collected 40 samples. So there's no, there's like 40, maybe 40 different people entered your trial or, you know, something of that kind. Uh, the second experiment started like a week later and, and maybe it ran for longer. The second experiment maybe had 80 samples. The third experiment maybe started before the first two finished but it ended also before the first two finished. So the third experiment was very short. It only collected 10 samples and then for whatever reason it was decided, okay, I don't care about this. We're stopping it over here. And this goes on forever. This just, you know, keeps going on. There could be multiple experiments that start off in a batch in parallel. Um, and, you know, time just goes on till infinity and the number of experiments keeps going on. And this is basically like, I don't know, this is a model for science like if you think about you know just asynchronous distributed people trying to find discoveries it could be a model for your own lab of for how things run it could be a model for pharmaceutical companies things like that one example which maybe people are uh, might be familiar with is uh, in the tech industry people run what's called ab tests and uh, whether you like it or not you are the usually the unwilling participant in lots and lots of tests if you go to amazon or google or microsoft or you know bing or uh, if you use any of these sites you are part you are a participant in a test or probably hundreds of tests throughout the year you they're constantly running tests so for some numbers um, uh, i think microsoft usually runs about 100 new tests every day there are about 36500 tests in a year um, uh, you know, I think AWS at Amazon, there's like thousands of tests running in parallel at any, any given point in time. And this is what the situation looked like. The, the tests start, they end, other ones have started, they end. There's just lots and lots of testing going on. It's a big mess. Okay. And, and the tests are happening, obviously, you know, sequentially over time. There's never any end to these tests. Like, you know, three years from now, Google's still going to be around probably, and they're going to still be running tests. And, uh, and so there's never a time at which you've seen all the tests or you know all the p-values or you know anything of that kind. You just have to correct for multiple testing on the fly if you plan to correct for it. Um, so this is an A-B test. It's like a two sample test. There's two versions, A and B, and, and, uh, and you're trying to see which one of these makes participants or you know, people coming to your website more likely to click on an ad or you know, something of that kind. Um, now, I mean, if you're in the pharmaceutical industry, maybe, you know, you don't care about A-B tests, but uh, you might have a, a situation where maybe there's a common control population. Uh, you know, uh, this could be either people without a disease who are given a drug or people with a disease who are given a placebo. There's some like control population that's just increasing over time. Uh, one control population, but you have, you might have many treatment populations. Like think of a Think of a disease like, uh, I don't know, like Crohn's disease or something where we haven't found a treatment. I don't know if we're likely to find a treatment. So there's constantly different trials going on over time, different treatments being, uh, you know, tested uh, against maybe a common control. Um, clearly, there's going to be some dependence between different tests. So within a test, maybe there's independence. But between tests, now there will be some dependence because there's some common control population that kind of data is shared between different tests. and so. Um, so, you know, I, I think the, this, this broad, this cartoon of doubly sequential experimentation really 
applies in many situations and um, it's one of the I don't know things I keep at the back of my mind when I'm thinking about these problems. Okay, so this talk is um, is going to be about what I call the outer sequential process. Okay, so what what kind of guarantees would be like? Well, it depends on the where we are looking. If you look at the inner sequential process, that's one experiment. That's one sequential experiment, and there you might care about just correct inference whenever the experiment ends. This could be a correct p-value at the end of an A-B test or a correct confidence interval for a treatment effect. That's if you're looking at at one process, a single experiment. That's that's the scale at which I would say usually we think about is like, how do we do this, this experiment or clinical trial or whatever it is correctly. Uh, but I'm going to be talking mostly, well, only in this talk. I have lots of work on the other one which is for time for some other talk. But this talk is about the outer sequential process where you might as well think collapse all of those horizontal lines into a single point and think that I'm just seeing like experiments one at a time. And, um, and, and then the question is, do I, do I want to do any correction for the fact that I'm running hundreds of thousands, you know, like 36,000 experiments in a year, or even if it's a few hundred experiments a year, do I want to do any correction for this fact when I declare a, a discovery, which means that, you know, I go and, you know, my, my drug goes to phase two of the trial or if I'm an, a, a, an internet company or whether I, I say that this uh, change I've made to my website has actually increased my revenue and I want to make this the standard for the whole website from now on. Um, so your quote unquote, your discovery is just an action that you take, uh, which could have monetary or scientific or other consequences. And so when you when you are ready to declare a discovery or you know declare I found something interesting, should you correct for the fact that you have been testing so many hypotheses and and you will be testing more in the future. And so if, if you're going to correct for it, the question is, how will you correct for it? Okay, so this is the, what I call the outer, outer sequential process. Okay, so, um, so the rest of this talk is about this, this outer sequential process, uh, but hopefully all of you at this point have the high level theme or vision of what I'm going to be talking about. So at this point, I will I will stop. So this, you know, I'm going to talk first talk about online FTR control with independent p-values, and then we'll I'll talk about later some extensions, you know, family-wise error rate or false coverage rate or how do we handle dependence and other things. But as I said, let's start with let's start by learning how to crawl, and then we'll learn how to walk later on. Um, but this is a good time to pause and see if anyone has any questions about the about the setup, about the, you know, the motivation. I haven't set things up formally yet, but just the broad motivation of the, of the problem. All right, it doesn't seem like there are any questions yet. So let me get started with the first part, online FTR control. Hopefully everyone knows what the false discovery rate is. If Actually, you there's a question in the chat box. So it's saying, oh, are is. all experiments accessing the same hypothesis, treatment effects? No, so I, I mean, I'm over, over here, I'm thinking that these experiments are all for different things. So when, when, uh, when A-B tests are run, they're, you know, for, you know, imagine, and I'll, I'll, I'll get into it right now. There's just different products uh, for which tests are being run. Uh, and then, you know, maybe in, in, uh, when you're looking at treatments, it's different drugs that you're looking for a, a treatment effect estimate of or something like that. So I'm, I'm broadly thinking about, um, uh, yeah, dif different, different parameters that you're interested in. Uh, but you could also ask the question of what if you're interested in the same parameter, which I have done work on in some other work. But in this talk, it's about different parameters. So that's a great question. Okay, great. All right. Okay. So as I said, this is the reality. Uh, internet companies run thousands of different or independent A-B tests over time. Uh, this is broadly what it looks like. Time here now is, you know, going from top to bottom. Maybe they test, okay, like uh, I'm asking a survey or something like that. Does the color of the background of the survey, you know, does it uh, affect how many people answer the survey? And and usually the decision rule is something, okay, they, they have like different people enter this trial over time. Some of them are randomized to the gray website and some of them are randomized to the blue website. And then they say, okay, does the color make any difference? And then, so this is a sequential two sample test. And then their decision rule is, well, is the p-value less than alpha? Okay, and then now there's some other thing. Okay, does changing the size of the cart 
uh, you know, make more people likely to shop. So there'll be two versions of a website. You get randomized into one of them and then they check is the P value less than alpha. And then, you know, does this process goes on and you're always testing at level alpha. Does the P value you get um, past level alpha? And, and that's, I think that's the problem. Of course, when you only look at one experiment, you think, oh, there's only one experiment. I was just testing one hypothesis. So there's no multiple testing correction. So I should just test at level alpha. But if you zoom out a little bit and you go to December 31st and you look back, you're like, oh, I tested 36,500 hypotheses at level alpha. That's clearly not a smart thing to do. And, and so I, I, I'm, that's an issue. And so the, the question, the formal question is, given or well, this is the baby question we'll come to more advanced questions later but given a possibly infinite sequence of tests by that i mean just an, let's say an infinite sequence of p values uh, can we control the false discovery rate in a fully online fashion and again the ftr is this expected ratio of the number of false discoveries up to time t divided by the total number of proclaimed discoveries at at time t and where t is just the number of experiments you have run so far um, and so if, you know, in, in this case, you should think about there being 36,500 experiments, but what I want perhaps is that, you know, up to March, I've run, you know, 3000 experiments and I would like the FTR to be small and up, up to July, I've run 8,000 experiments and I would like the FTR to be small and, and so on. And this process is really never going to stop. So at any point in time, I would like the false discovery up to that time to be controlled, let's say at level 0.1 or something of that kind. And so what we're going to do is like, you know, control, like testing everything at level alpha is it's not going to cut it. And so what we're going to ask is, well, we're going to have to test things at different levels. And so we're going to test P1 at level alpha one, P2 at level alpha two. And, and the question is, well, how do we set uh, these levels so that um, the FDR is actually controlled at any time? And I can see that my, uh, my computer has decided to to get stuck. So can you guys still hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. But my screen isn't moving. So ah, there we go. Suddenly it decided to move. So I will play back again. So yeah, so there's this sequence that you're going to do. It's an infinite sequence. And the question is, how do we set these alphas so that we actually have guaranteed FDR control at any time? And the main point is decisions are irrevocable. So in January, you find, hey, I found an interesting change to the website that makes me a lot of money or, hey, I think this drug actually is much better than control. We should push it to phase two. Uh, you know, in December, you don't get back, you don't get to go back and be like, hey, can we not send that drug to phase two or, or can we not actually make that change to the website? So you, you have to commit to a change. And, you know, when the first, you know, test is done, you commit to saying, do I think it's significant or not? And then when the second test is done, you read, do I think it's significant or not? And so you make the sequence of tests. The decisions are irre irrevocable. This goes on forever. That's like the main point. And, um, and you would like FDR control at any time. Okay. And now, obviously, offline FDR methods don't guarantee this. So running Benjamin E. Hochberg on the first T hypotheses or something of that kind is not going to yield any such guarantee. And so we would like to come up with a different class of methods for this. Okay, so this is a high level picture. Um, and I use Keynote to give my talks and part of the good, good thing about Keynote is that it's hard to uh, type equations in LaTeX and so you're forced to try and use other methods of communication such as visual or something else. And so um, I thought of a visual way of conveying what do online FDR control algorithms do? What do they do? Okay, so here's what they do. So they have some kind of error budget. You should think of this as this yellow ball as being alpha and and that's your error budget or alpha wealth and and what you do is you assign some error budget for the first experiment that's alpha one you assign some error budget for the second alpha two and as you as you keep running experiments you keep using up your error budget you use up wealth but the interesting thing is whenever you make a discovery you earn back wealth so let's say the you know the first three you didn't find anything interesting suppose the fourth one suppose p4 was less than alpha four then you actually get back alpha. Um, again, my, my computer keeps getting stuck for some reason. Sorry about that. So, so we have the third step, we have the fourth step, we get back alpha. And we keep doing this, so the error budget at each step is data dependent. It depends on what discoveries have been made in the past. But this is an infinite process in which 
our current error budget shrinks and then once in a while we make a discovery and we earn back extra error budget and so this is what online fdr algorithms do they assign different alphas at each step and this is not a hopeless process where your alpha sequence is decreasing over time if you were trying to control the family wise error rate then your alpha sequence would just be decreasing over time but luckily because you're trying to control the false discovery rate which is a little bit more of a generous error metric you actually get back wealth every time you make a discovery and so now the question is okay so this is the high level picture now what exactly how do we de design how much uh, wealth we earn and how much wealth we spend and um, and all of this but you should think about yourself having some pocket money and you get to spend on each experiment and and then get back some earnings when you were right okay so here's a selective history of you know of this area so in in uh, jrssb paper in 2008 foster and stein um, you know they conceptualized this online multiple testing problem and and they you know created an algorithm called alpha investing uh, i've written an mfdr there because they they proved that it you know gives a modified fdr control it's um, where it's the ratio of the expectations instead of the expected ratio um Aroni and Rosset, uh, they uh, they generalized this alpha investing algorithms and 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 they suggested trying to use this idea for what are called quality preserving databases. This is a setting where there's a public database and different people download it to test different things, but the number of downloads are tracked and what you're testing is tracked in some sense. So you preserve the quality of the database. The database doesn't go stale in some sense because you you understand how many hypotheses are being testing you keep track of that so they they tried to motivate this as a potential application of, of these methods i don't think it has caught on fully yet but i think it's a very nice idea um then javanmard and montanari in their annals of stats 2018 paper they created another algorithm which is called lord for fdr control and and uh, they suggested this application to a b testing in industry saying okay so these the, the you know um I think that again, that's a very nice application area for these methods. Um, so we actually, I mean, their paper came out on archive in 2016, and then in in 2017 we actually improved improved the Lord algorithm to something we call Lord Plus Plus. It was a variant a variant of Lord, so we didn't change the name, but it it uniformly improves Lord, and we introduced this new Oracle perspective of how to think about FDR algorithms and and designing them, um, and then we. Uh, we improved that to what's called, yeah, you know, what we call the Saffron algorithm. Each of these is an acronym for something, but the acronyms don't matter. This is adaptive to the unknown null proportion of, uh, if again people in FDR will know what adaptive to null proportion means. And for now, you know, I'll, I'll get to it later on. And most recently, I would say this is probably one of the state-of-the-art algorithms. Is um, it's adaptive to both the number of nulls and to some of the nulls being very conservative. So you're getting, you know, large p-values for some reason. So you can discard conservative nulls somehow because this is just within fdr control and then there's other work on other error metrics which i'll talk about later on so um there's two perspectives on online fdr control and i think the the original papers had a very algorithmic uh, perspective and and so they said if we want to define an algorithm for online fdr we must describe three things we must specify how much wealth we start off with the, the size of that big yellow ball we have to specify that we have to specify and my screen is stuck again so i will try once more uh, we must specify how much wealth is subtracted every time we we test something how much wealth do we lose and we must specify how much wealth is awarded every time we make a discovery how much do we gain so we specify these three things and that specifies an algorithm and that's the earlier viewpoint and once you specify these three things you you somehow you know come up with a proof that for these choices your fdr is controlled as you claimed um now um that's you know alpha investing generalized ai and lord now we introduced a, a statistical perspective that helped us start off from this work build on this work but improve it and the statistical perspective was to define an algorithm we're going to do something else instead we're going to def design an empirical estimate which i'm going to call fdp hat so it's an empirical estimator of the false discovery proportion now you don't know the false discovery proportion because it's the proportion it's the it's the number of false discoveries divided by the number of proclaimed discoveries now you know the denominator the number of proclaimed discoveries you know but you don't know how many of them were false discoveries and weren't so the, the fdp is a random variable that is unknown but we can design estimators for them so let's design an estimator an empirical estimator and i'm going to call that fdp hat um 
then we prove this kind of connector lemma. And this connector lemma says that if we keep FDP hat bounded by alpha, then it, it actually implies that the FDR, which we don't know uh, in general, is also less than alpha. So this is like a connector lemma. And, and then what we're going to do is we're going to design some you know, monotone sequences alpha t, a monotone meaning not that they're monotone decreasing or increasing, but they're monotone in past rejections, which means that the more rejections you've made in the past, alpha can only go up. So it's monotone, it's a particular monotone mapping of the past. Uh, so you design these monotone sequences that keeps your empirical estimate under control. You don't know the true FDR or the true FTP, but you can keep your empirical estimator less than alpha. And so it turns out that that uh, the new algorithms, which are more powerful than the old ones, uh, they are they work under this perspective, and and basically it, it moves the problem of algorithm design to a more statistical problem. Like we all know how to design estimators and analyze their you know you know their bias or their variance or whatever other quantity and and prove properties of estimators. So now we design essentially we we design better estimators. Uh, but the interesting thing is that we can view older algorithms as keeping track of estimators they were not written that way they were written uh, as you know wealth being subtracted and added but they were implicitly keeping track of some empirical estimate we can write that empirical estimate down and then we can say hey that's suboptimal we can we can we should be tracking a better empirical estimate and and that's what results in the more powerful algorithms that we've more recently designed right okay so i just said that last slide okay so here is a simple here's the simple oracle estimate for the false discovery proportion i'm going to say oracle because we don't know this estimate but it helps guide designing an estimate so if test t had an error threshold alpha t so alpha t is just some number for now then what we're going to design we're going to call this fdp star of t as this ratio again the denominator is something you know you know the number of discoveries up to time t the numerator is the quantity of interest so that is i am going to sum up alpha t of for all times until the current one but i'm only going to sum it up over the nulls so this is why we call it an oracle estimate is because we don't know the nulls we don't know which are the true nulls and the false nulls and so on and and you know that's uh, otherwise the problem would be trivial uh, and but in, let's say an oracle does so if an oracle knows the nulls then it's going to sum up the alpha t just over the nulls and divide by the total number of discoveries and let's call that ftp star and so the first proposition is that if any procedure, if you design any procedure that keeps FDP star less than alpha, then it also keeps the modified FDR less than alpha. Modified FDR being ratio of the expectations uh, less than alpha. Um, uh, you can prove a second uh, lemma. If you really care about FDR control and not modified FDR control, then, then you can prove a a result that says, well, if you need independent independence now, if the null p values are independent of all other p values, and if alpha t is a monotone function of the past rejections, then if you can keep FDP star less than alpha, then the true FDR is also less than alpha. Okay, so these are like connector lemmas that say, what I want is FDR control, and what an oracle would do is keep FDP star under control. Um, now at least we know what we're trying to aim for. We're trying to keep FTP star control, but we don't know what the nulls are. So let's do something simple. Okay, what we want to do is something like this, but I apologize again for my computer freezing up. Um, and so what Lord++ does is it removes the constraint on the nulls. So it def defines the empirical estimator FDP hat as just saying, let's just sum over all alphas. I, I don't know what the nulls are. So if I if I sum over all, all alphas, all times, then it's only more conservative. So FDP hat is a conservative estimate of FDP star. And so if I can keep FDP hat less than alpha, then I've kept FDP star less than alpha, then I get FDR less than alpha. So, so that's the simplest um, estimate. And that immediately improves on the Lord algorithm uh, from Javanmad and Montanari Annals of Statistics 2018. Okay, so it counts all non-nulls as nulls. It's, it's trivially conservative. And so you can say, okay, that's a nice observation. This algorithmic viewpoint already has, sorry, the statistical viewpoint has already helped, but can it help by completely changing what, what our estimate is? So this was trivial, but let's do something different. So that's what we did with Saffron. So 
it's a little bit more complicated in terms of the um, notation, but we are now going to choose some uh, lambda t. Lambda t is some, uh, some constant. Think of it as half for simplicity if you want. And we are go we're going to, uh, we're going to have this additional, um, you know, this fraction over there, which is, is the p-value larger than a half divided by a half? Okay. So this is kind of, this is kind of looking at, this is a running estimate of the number of nulls in some sense. So this says, don't count. This says count every, just count every alpha. This says don't count every alpha. If the p-value is larger than a half, don't count it. If the p-value is smaller than a half, then count it as double. And the idea is that the non-nulls are more likely to be less than a half, so you'll always count them. The nulls are equally likely to be less than a half or greater than a half, but I only wanted to be tracking the nulls anyway. That's, that's all I wanted to track. And so half the time, I don't count them. Half the time, I count them as double. And this ends up being a, a tighter bound. And, and, uh, and well, the reason is that, well, I don't, this sum doesn't count any of the non-nulls. The non-nulls are hopefully small p-values and they attribute zero to this sum. But over here, I'm counting all the non-nulls as well. Okay, so again, we'll, for simplicity, you suggest a default of a half. But if you use lambda t as alpha t itself, then you get back alpha investing from you know, Foster and Stein 2008. So this is actually implicitly what alpha investing was tracking. So it was an adaptive algorithm, except it was using alpha t. And in our experiments, alpha t was not the most powerful choice. Half was a much better choice. And so again, the intuition is that if there are strong signals or large sample sizes, then all the non-null p-values will be small and they're excluded from the sum. So this will be a less conservative estimate. So it's not necessarily conservative, in fact. So I view LOD++ as being the online analog, analog of the benjamini hochberg procedure. So those of you who are familiar with uh, the benjamini hochberg procedure, one of the ways of motivating it is defining an empirical estimate of the FTP and keeping that less than alpha. Um, and this looks like the empirical estimate of the FTP for benjamini hochberg um, except that the alphas are varying over here while the, alpha, you know, the, over there, the alpha is just a constant for the benjamini hochberg procedure. And I view um, Saffron as being uh, an online analog of the story BH procedure. Um, okay, so the problem is so so this is this was a again a good next step, um, but it is it has low power for conservative nulls. So what are conservative nulls? Conservative nulls are nulls in which the p-value is not uniformly distributed. The p-value actually ha is is cl closer to one. So you can imagine that you're, you know, testing the null that a Gaussian has zero mean versus positive mean, but actually in reality, the Gaussian has a negative mean and, and, and then the p-value distribution is, is leaning towards one rather than being uniform. And now, you know, this, this estimate suffers in that case. The reason it suffers is because now I'm counting too many things. Earlier, my intuition was I count half the nulls and I, I discard half the nulls, but now if the p-values are mostly large, imagine all, all the null p-values are one then I count them every time and I double them. So this estimate is very conservative if I have um, a lot of conservative nulls. And so here's a generic thing you can do. You can do this in the offline setting. You can do this in the online setting. You just adaptively discard the nulls. So what is discarding? The idea is simple. Whenever a p-value, you, you can do this if in the offline setting, you can do this at the start. If you have p-values larger than a half, just throw them all away. Just throw away every p-value larger than a half. And everything that remains, you double it and then test it. Okay, so like imagine Benjamini Hochberg itself, you can do this. Take your set of p-values, 10,000 p-values, throw away everything larger than a half, whatever remains, maybe 3,000 remain, double those p-values and run Benjamini Hochberg on that procedure. So this process is called discarding. And if, you're, if you have a lot of conservative p-values, you'll throw away many p-values and reduce the effect of multiplicity a lot. Um, and, and the thing is you can do this in an online fashion as well is whenever PT is greater than a half, you just throw it away. And if it's less than a half, then you double it and feed it to saffron. So that's why we call it adaptive discarding. And then this actually basically says it don't waste wealth on nulls. If something looks null, don't waste wealth on it. Just, you know, it doesn't even take part in the multiple testing procedure, but if, if it's, you know, if it's less than a half, then you have to pay some price. You, you have to double it and, and, and then test it. So uh, if everything's uniform, it makes no difference. You just throw away half of them at random 
and you know double the other ones um uh, but if everything is non uniform ten, you know where the nulls tend to be concentrated near one and the non nulls tend to be concentrated near zero then addis will be much more powerful than saffron or lot plus plus okay so those are the high level ideas i'm not going to you know show you an algorithm box because you know it's not worth it if you get the high level idea hopefully you will understand the algorithm box in the paper okay this is a good spot for me to pause um and see if there are any questions so i think this part i've basically introduced basic intuition for what the online fdr algorithm does it assigns different alpha i's by keeping track of some wealth and spending and earning wealth and one you know unified way to do that is to estimate the false discovery proportion write down some estimator and then uh keep that estimator in control and so the various algorithms do do that in in different sophisticated ways but that at least at a high level is a unifying idea all right any questions okay so so this idea you know there's nothing particular to false discovery rate control for this idea this really applies to any setting in which you're trying to make a sequence of decisions so you know we have work on controlling the family wise error rate if you don't like testing and you like estimation these problems don't go away go away but you can control the false coverage rate um you can handle dependence so i'll just show you kind of what is the main idea in in you know some of these uh, uh, these problems I, i won't go into any details but just kind of stay at a high level to tell you what are the problems and you know how why how one might solve them okay so some people believe that moving from p values to confidence intervals solves all issues this is mysterious to me there's a duality between confidence intervals and families of hypothesis tests changing things from testing to confidence intervals does not take any make make any problem disappear it just moves where the problem is happening to somewhere else um and so selective reporting of 1 minus alpha confidence intervals also is an issue and it inflates the false coverage rate okay so here's a cartoon picture to show you why that might happen so let's say there's you know a drug and it's just placebo versus placebo and you know you calculate a 95% confidence interval let's say you know it contains this is like for some treat average treatment effect or something like that it contains zero you choose not to report it nobody finds out there's another drug let's say actually you know it's a placebo versus a drug uh, but for whatever reason low sample size or whatever it is your theta 2 estimate it the the confidence interval contains zero so you choose not to report it um there's a third drug still contains zero you choose not to report it there's now a fourth drug where it's actually a you know a non null um uh meaning there's actually a treatment effect and now you find that your 95% confidence interval can, is like 0.1 to 0.2 and you're like oh i found something interesting let me report it let me write a paper about it let me send it to phase 2 of the clinical trial i mean this is clearly an issue um there is a selection bias going on you didn't report every confidence interval you reported only the ones that seemed to look promising and uh, and the false coverage rate is going to be very large and uh, all your estimated treatment effects will be exaggerated and so you know one has to correct for selection even if you're dealing with confidence intervals and one simple way to imagine all of this is imagine everything was just placebo versus placebo you know every every drugs just a placebo and you just do this you are going to report something like at some point for the maybe with the 18th drug you will find a confidence interval that doesn't contain zero and you will report that if you don't correct for it you're going to be in trouble so um you know moving to confidence intervals is also an issue and and so the false coverage rate is this expected ratio of the number of incorrectly reported confidence intervals to the number of reported confidence intervals okay so again this i'm dealing with this in a sequential problem where you're you're dealing with different drugs over time but this the same problem occurs in the batch setting itself if you calculate a few hundred confidence intervals but only choose to report like 10 of them in your abstract or three of them in your abstract then you have selection bias and you need to correct for it so so what about what is the the online false coverage rate problem when experiment j starts we must assign a target confidence level alpha j when experiment j ends we must decide whether we want to report theta j or not whether we found it interesting or not and this must be done in such a way that the false coverage rate is controlled at any time and so we have a recent paper on how to do this and and uh, and the important point is that 
FDR control does not imply FCR control, but the implication is the other way around. If I give you an algorithm that can control the false coverage rate in an online fashion, then you can get an algorithm that controls the false discovery rate as well, but, but not vice versa. So the FCR control algorithm is, is more general. Um, but, but since there's no notion of a null, um, you can't correct for adapt, you know, being adaptive to the null proportion or something like that. So the algorithm looks like the Lord plus plus algorithm, but now it takes in confidence intervals at each step and adjusts them. The high level picture is the same. I can't construct one minus alpha confidence intervals at each step. I can't do that. Uh, I don't want to do Bonferroni or something like that, which will just make the future confidence intervals just wider and wider. So I have to do something a little bit adaptive and earn and lose wealth depending on what I choose to report. And and the false coverage rate will be controlled at any time. Okay, so that's that's like one of the areas that we've worked on. And if you're interested in confidence intervals, you can look at that paper. Um, here's another interesting thought experiment. This is a, what I call a simultaneous uh, post hoc bound. Okay, so what if you did not use an online FCR or FDR algorithm? So if you're a currently a pharmaceutical company or a, uh, or a tech industry company, whatever, and, and you didn't use any of this, you didn't know this, you didn't use it, but at the end of the year, you would still like some answer to this question based on the decisions that I made and based on the error levels that I used. The error levels could have been all 0.05 or they could have been something else, but whatever error levels I used and whatever decisions I made, I want to ask how large could my FCR or FDR be? How large could it be? Okay, this is like a post hoc question. I want to look back and say, how well did I do? And so we have this, you know, kind of a, a very cute expression. There's a lot of martingale techniques in the background, but the expression at the end is, is fairly nice. It says that with probability at least one minus delta, um, your false discovery proportion at time t is at most this empirical quantity that you know. The denominator is the number of rejections or the number of discoveries, you know this. The numerator is one plus the sum of the, sum, the, sum of the levels that you've used. Okay, so you know this quantity. You multiply that by log one over delta divided by log log one over delta, um, and this is a this is a bound on the false discovery proportion which you don't know. You don't know the false discovery proportion, but you know this right hand side, and this is a bound simultaneously for all t from one to infinity. So you can keep running track of how well you are doing in hindsight, whether or not these alpha i's came from an algorithm. Like these alpha i's could have all been constant or they could have come from an online FDR algorithm. They could, have be, they could be anything, but this bound is valid simultaneously for all T. Okay, so this, this, this basically tells you in hindsight, you can ask this question, how well was I doing in June? How well was I doing in November? How well am I doing today? And you can keep track of that bound. So we call this a simultaneous post hoc bound. And it's the same for, for false coverage proportion for confidence, re reported confidence intervals as well. It's the same, same kind of an expression. And, and so this is, if you're interested in how do you derive such bounds, not just in the online setting, but we do it for knockoffs for the offline setting for Benjamin Hochberg for, for other FDR procedures in other structured settings. You can look at our upcoming annals paper uh, for this style of post hoc bounds. Now, uh, you know, it's natural for someone to think, Hey, you know, when the year is 2024, will you really care about what, you know, rejections and discoveries or, you know, whatever mistakes you made in 2020? And the answer is probably not like, I mean, like, you know, recent tests are probably more relevant than really old tests from seven years ago. And so we might want to smoothly forget the past, like, and, and wait the more recent discoveries more than the past ones. And so with this motivation, you might, you might want to define something like the decaying memory false discovery rate. You choose a decay parameter less than one and you have some kind of exponentially weighted average, uh, which I call the mem FDR. And if you choose D equal to one, this is just the usual false discovery rate. And D just tells you how quickly do I want to forget what happened long ago? And so that's what D is. And so uh, D equal to one means I don't want to forget the past. It all counts equally. And you know, D equal to 0.99 is probably a reasonable choice. And so we have some uh, algorithms that can control the mem FDR. Uh, and so naturally take into account that I am in an online problem and um, I want to use that intuition in defining the error metric itself. The last thing I'll talk about is, you know, just briefly, how do you handle some kind of local dependence? So everything I said so far is 
independent p-values, but of course, hypotheses can be dependent or the data used to test them can be dependent. And so, um, you know, you can, uh, you know, if you, if you assume something like arbitrary dependence between all p-values, that's extremely pessimistic. That's saying my 10,000th p-value and my first p-value are arbitrarily dependent. That's very pessimistic and also unrealistic. So instead, a middle ground is a, no, a flexible notion of local dependence based on some notion of a lag, where you say that my p-value pt, it arbitrarily depends on the previous lt p-values. So where lt could be, you know, if lt is zero, it means you're in the independent case. If LT is infinity, that means that everything is arbitrarily dependent on everything else. And then, then the, on, the algorithm just looks like online Bonferroni. But if LT is like five or three or something like that, or 10, then, then you're saying, hey, like the p-values locally are arbitrarily dependent, but beyond that, they are independent. And so all of these algorithms, they naturally um, can account for this kind of local dependence. And the, the, the change you have to make is the wealth gets awarded five steps later. So the wealth you get now from your discovery now is not awarded immediately. It's just awarded five steps later. And then you can prove that it automatically handles this kind of FDR control with local dependent structures. Um, yeah, and, and the same with FCR control as well. They can be easily modified. All right. The work that I'm currently doing right now is viewing online multiple testing as a control problem where control, you know, for people familiar with, you know, electrical engineering work, uh, we're trying to maximize power, keep the false discovery rate in check. And we think of nature as our adversary in terms of how it's giving the sequence of hypotheses to us. It's not really adversarial, but we don't know the sequence. It could be any sequence of nulls and non-nulls could come in the future. And so we have to protect ourselves against any sequence. So it's adversarial in that sense. Um, and so how do we, you know, can we view this as a control problem? Can we use control principles to design better online FDR algorithms and, you know, you know, at a high level, the answer is, um, the answer is yes. Sorry, that my thing is jumping. The answer is yes, it does yield more powerful algorithms, not just for FDR, but also for the false discovery proportion at arbitrary stopping times of the experiment as well. And so this is ongoing work that's unpublished. So I'm not really going to say much more about it. Here are a few open problems like uh, people like this notion of positive dependence instead of arbitrary dependence. So can we prove that these algorithms control FDR under positive dependence? That's still an open question. Uh, we might want some hierarchical notion of error for large organizations. So rather than just controlling the overall FDR, we might want some notion of group level FDR uh, and organization level FDR or something of that kind. And, um, or, you know, paper level FDR and lab level FDR or something like that. And uh, how do we incentivize cooperation between groups? Like one group might say, hey, because the other group tested so many hypotheses, why do we have to test at a lower alpha level and things like that? So I'm not sure how to handle these questions. I think they're still open. Um, you know, post, can we get post hoc bounds under arbitrary dependence? Are there online anal analogs of the closed testing procedure? And finally, empirical based methods have proven to be very powerful in the offline problem. Can we can we get, can we use empirical based ideas in this online problem as well? And so, uh, you know, you can prove that the thresh, thresholding the posterior probability of a, of, of a high, you know, of theta being non-null is basically, that's the optimal thing to do, but we don't know what the posterior is. And so we want something empirical. Can that be made robust to misspecification? I think that's an important kind of direction for future work. We have some software online. So this is being maintained by David Robertson in collaboration uh, with me and and so you can all go try it out it's called online fdr no surprises um you know we've been making we have been making updates well there's family wise error rate algorithms online there's fcr there's all these variants saffron addis everything's already in the package you can try it out yourself if you want um you know there's references and links to all of these papers on my website if there's a section called multiple testing if you go there you'll you'll see the first few are this decaying memory FDR and Saffron and Addis. Uh, the more recent ones are these false discovery proportion, uh, simultaneous bounds or false coverage rate bounds, things like that. Um, and you know, how do you do this asynchronously when things are just going crazy and different tests are starting and ending at different times and how do you handle this kind of asynchronous setting? So you can find links to all of these uh, on my website. I'd like to once again, thank my excellent collaborators. Uh, some of these are still my students. Some of them were my postdocs and now have moved on to faculty positions. And And uh, I'd like to, well, thank all of you for for coming uh, at, at a difficult time. And, and I'd like to stop there and uh, see if there are any questions. 
Hey, uh, DJ, this is Michael Hudgens. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Uh, that was really fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, you know, you, you've set the bar very high for our seminar speakers for this semester. Thank you. Um, I had a couple questions. Sure. One um, is, um, do you add wealth for all discoveries or yes. just true discoveries? You don't know what's a true discovery, so you add wealth for all discoveries, right? So you never find out the ground truth in this, in this game that you're playing with nature. Well, in usual multiple testing, it's the same thing. You have 10,000 hypotheses in one batch. You, you run a, a you know, Benjamin Hochberg and then you report something, but you never know which were the true discoveries and which were the false ones. It's the same thing over here. Nature never came, comes back and tells you, hey, you got that one right. Or, well, if it, did, if it does, we're not using it right now. So you just, you just, every time you make a discovery or you proclaim a discovery, you earn wealth alpha. And, and then you, you spend it over time. So every time you get a p-value that pi is actually less than alpha i, you get back some wealth. And if pi is not less than alpha i, then you've lost, you've, you've just lost that alpha i, it's gone forever. Thanks. Um, I had a second question, which was your FTP estimator, it looked like it had sort of a Horowitz-Thompson form. Um, yeah. And I wonder if you could use like a Hayek form instead and if that would do any better. Yeah, uh, that that is a good question. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, I I'm not surprised that uh, you you see the connections to uh, to things used in causal inference. Um, yeah, so I I don't know. Um, that's that's probably worth exploring, and uh, I don't know is just the right answer. Yeah. Yeah. Great talk. Thanks so much. Are you seeing the chat? Yeah, I am seeing the chat. I'm trying to read this long question. So I'll read it out. Uh, um, unless Anne-Marie wants to unmute herself and ask a question. Otherwise, I can read out the question. Um, I can read it. Oh, yeah. Sure. Um, hi, this is Anne. Great talk. Thank you. Thank you. So my question was, in the spirit of your student question, I think it was question B, um, we're seeing everyone downloading and beginning to analyze CDC's data, right? Their COVID-19 data. Indeed. And my question for you is, how would you, well, I guess, how would you control a situation like this? Because even if people are clicking the data and downloading it, you don't know if they're analyzing it, you don't know what questions they're asking. So um, what would you do in a situation like this? Yeah, it's, it's, I think that's an open question. That initial question was really a broad, open question. We should think about what should we do about it. Clearly, I can, we can play this experiment or at least this thought experiment in which we put up null data. We put up a set of covariates and a bunch of, you know, observations and we just put it up and we say, Hey, this is COVID data. And we know there's nothing. We just made all of that data up and we say, Hey, why don't you download something and tell us which covariates are important for predicting this. And you can bet that people will find something like, as you said, like hundreds of people will download this data set. And you know, most of them will try some basic regressions. They'll be like, okay, there's nothing here. They'll move on. But some of them will, will, you know, you know, throw out some outliers and then normalize some covariates and then uh, they'll do something else. And then they'll say, Hey, we found something. We think these covariates are important. So, so clearly, you know, people like even if you put up a null data set people will find something and and the more people who download that data set the more likely it is that they will find something nonsensical and so yes the 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 likelihood of making false discoveries definitely goes up with the more people that download and try things out and it, it is it is just multiple testing but just at a different scale like uh, if most people don't tell you that they downloaded, that's that's what's happening is is that most people don't even tell you that they downloaded the data and tried something. Uh, but those who downloaded the data and found something interesting, write a paper about it. But they are now somehow not subject to the selective bias that came in because all of the other publication bias, if you want to if you want to think of it that way, for all the other people that tried things and didn't find anything. So we do have some kind of a meta level multiple testing problem going on, but I don't know how to correct for it. But what the 2014 paper by Aharoni and Rosset, this quality preserving databases idea is that in some sense, every download also comes with an alpha I budget saying that, hey, you only get to test things at level alpha I. And if you find something, you better tell us. And if you tell us, then we'll increase the error budget for this data set. And then the next person comes in, they, you know, they, you know, they get to get alpha I plus one. And uh, so they, these are assigned and you, it's not all 0.05 for everybody. And, uh, and you have to report in some sense what you tried and what failed and what worked and you know, something like that. So, I mean, this was their goal, their broad level vision. I don't know if anybody actually 
does this for any data set today, but, uh, and I don't know if it's practical to do it, but these are all questions for us to ponder about. I don't have an answer. Thank you. So I have another question on that nature. Should labs and journals publish this kind of bound on their FDR as a measure of their scientific quality? I don't know. Um, this is something, I mean, there's clearly, you know, pros and cons to adding checks at multiple levels. So like now we have already made it a norm that everybody writing a neuroscience paper, uh, you know, has to run some kind of multiple testing procedure on their paper before, you know, submitting. If you, if you didn't correct in a neuroscience fMRI experiment, they won't even, you know, they'll just reject your paper immediately. So we now have that level. Now, should we do something at a journal level and should we do something at a field level? I don't know. Uh, it might be too much, but maybe we, at least everyone should be aware of it that this kind of issue uh, occurs. Um, I think Google should be doing something like this. If Google is, or, you know, Microsoft, whoever, Bing is running 36,500 experiments a year. If they're not correcting for multiple testing, then many changes they're making to their system are bound to be just by chance. And so if they're concerned about wasting engineer effort in while making changes that are useless, then they should somehow correct for the fact that they're test trying so many things out that some of them are going to just show up as null by chance. So, I mean, I'm obviously abstracting out and making it sound simplistic. They do have checks and balances in place to make sure that they're not, you know, things are not null, but, but I don't think they're doing anything formal more. It's usually a little bit more heuristic and it's the same thing with, pharmaceutical companies, like we do see that, you know, phase two trials, you know, fail much more often than, you know, and then phase three trials phase, you know, they fail a lot. And I mean, of course, some of them might be because of side effects or, you know, some other thing, but, but some of them might just be because we don't correct for the fact that we like the, the drugs that failed, we just, we like forget about them and a drug that passes, we just report it's 95% confidence interval for the treatment effect. And we plan the sample size for the next experiment based on this, estimate for the treatment effect, but that estimate for the treatment effect, that confidence interval was not corrected. So it's definitely exaggerated because of the selection bias. And so the next level sample size is underestimated. And so it's no wonder that the experiment fails. So, I mean, I think it's an issue. I can't prove it's an issue, but I think it's an issue that confidence intervals are also not corrected, you know, in pharmaceutical companies. I think, I don't think anyone does this kind of online FCR control because well, the procedure was published this year. But I would be curious to know if people think otherwise. It's just an opinion at this point. Any other questions? I mean, I see a question in the box. I can just read it out. So the idea of throwing out all p-values greater than 0.5 and doubling the leftovers, very interesting idea. Is there a name other than discarding for this principle? I don't believe that there is a name other than discarding. No, there's this idea was kind of discovered simultaneously in kind of the 2019, 2020 timeframe. So there's a paper by Yele Goman uh, in biostatistics with this idea. There's a paper in JASA by uh, I think Ching Yuan Zhao, uh, Dylan Small and Wei Ji Su, I think in JASA from last year, which was a causal inference paper in which they suggested to do this. And then there's, you know, there's our paper ADIS, which does this in the online setting. So um, there's kind of few papers recently that are pointing this out. I don't think it has a name other than discarding, but yeah, I think everybody should just, just should just do this. The correction, yeah, just just throw away everything greater than 0.5 and double the rest, and then proceed. Uh, and I'm just saying 0.5 as an example. You can throw away everything greater than 0.33 and triple the rest. I mean, that's also fine. I, I don't know how how to pick that parameter, so I made it 0.5. But uh, yeah, I think everybody should do it. I mean, I've seen p-values from uh, GWAS data because I mean, a lot of my work is related to GWAS and neuroscience and you know, it's, it's often there's a, it's like there's a peak near one for some reason. I don't know, maybe it's misspecification of the null or maybe it's a conservative null. There's often a peak near one and you're kind of unnecessarily paying a multiple testing price for conservative p-values. In some sense, if you think about it, conservative p-values are the easy case for multiple testing. If I give you a p-value of 0.99, you shouldn't have to think twice before saying that's a null. So why are we paying a multiple testing correction if we see a p-value of 0.99? So all of this is saying is that anything greater than a half, just think of it as null, throw it away. And if you have lots of them, then you've gained a lot by you know really reducing the number of hypotheses, effective number of hypotheses you're dealing with. But now you have to correct for this fact because everything now is between zero and 0.5. Everything that you've kept is now between zero and 0.5. Those are clearly not p-values. You double them. 
So now they're between zero and one. And now you use that. And so pretty, I think it's a pretty simple idea. So oh, I, I think we have five past the four. So uh, any, any, any other questions? So if you know, let's, okay, let's thank our speaker again. And then it's so, it's so great, Sim. It's so great talking. We, we really enjoy it. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you all for, for staying. It's just really wonderful to see such a big turnout at, 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 at a difficult time. Yeah, thank you. And let me okay, know okay, if you want to talk tomorrow because okay. I have some free slots in the schedule. So I'm happy to chat about any of these or the other topics I work on. Okay, great. Thank, thank you. you. Okay, bye-bye. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thanks. Thank you.